Hello, they call me Mr. Dawn. I'm here to talk about a bandsaw wizard. What it is, is a, a lot of jigs to put on your bandsaw to make odd shaped items easy to cut. So pretty much what we have here in this box is a, a new table. And we slide this on the existing bandsaw table and adjust it. And now you have a foundation for a lot of other jigs that you could use for anything you can imagine. So let's begin by looking at what's inside the box. This is uh, a combination of 40 years of experience on a bandsaw. And I always made a specialty jig for this or that hanging on the wall. And all of a sudden now I have all these trophies on the wall. And I rarely use them again. So what I tried to come up with was uh, a system where you have a nice table you can cut circles on. Uh, you have other jigs that you can apply in T-tracks uh, and be able to cut odd shape items because odd shape items are very dangerous uh, to cut all by themselves without a support. So for those uh, weekend woodworker warriors, here's uh, the instructions that's uh, written semi-well. Um, for those who like to read, please read them because there's lots of information. For those who don't like to read, we did produce a lot of pictures. So if you follow it, um, you might be successful. Although I generally don't read instructions <laughs> until I make a mistake. So you're probably one of those persons. <laughs> anyway, this is a table and these are runners. Uh, the runners are going to run in your dado in your bandsaw table. I provided two. There's a little one that's under three quarters of an inch and three quarters of an inch wide because a lot of your dados aren't exactly three quarter inch. So slide this in your own bandsaw's dado and see if it runs loose and we'll show you that later. Once you take this apart there's a secondary table that actually is going to slide onto your bandsaw. <clears throat> the bandsaw blade comes into here. This is a T-track for T-nuts and bolts. Uh, so you can tighten a pivot point here and you can spin circles. Um, the other T-tracks are for other jigs and even if you don't have a fence, you can actually make your own fence and use this as a 90 degree offset you're going to be actually mounting your guide runner on the back side. So you're going to set this up where you'll put it on the bandsaw and it'll ride right in your own groove and be perpendicular and parallel to your blade. These tracks are for actually the angled clamps that will actually clamp to the underside of your own bandsaw table so you don't have any exposed clamps all the way around to clamp it to your table so it doesn't move. So everything is underneath, and now you have the full use of actually a larger table than your own bandsaw table. This particular size will fit any bandsaw between 12 inch and 18 inch. Uh, so this is a pretty much a universal table. Uh, for future use, there are holes and dowels for extensions, but we're just going to be talking about this table for now. Okay, these come with angle blocks or angle clamps. Basically, it's a piece of maple that has a 45 degree angle on it. And the idea is, is that you put your knob and your T-bolt in there and it slides right into the track on the underside. Now this is the back side of the table and you pretty much clamp them down. Now the idea is your bandsaw table will fit the edge. Now sometimes, you know, this angle on this pre-cut item is not quite perfect for your own table or your fence rail. So you can take and cut your own profile on your block. And that's why they're wood. So you can do anything you need to to get these to clamp to your own front edge of your table and the back edge of your table. Uh, that being said, you can leave them like a 45 degree if you like or not. So this has two on the out, outboard only because you're going to have a saw kerf actually where this line is uh, in this table. So basically, you're going to follow this line and, and cut into this and stop. And we'll show you how to do that later. 
Before you install your bandsaw wizard table, make sure that your blade is perpendicular in two planes off your table. If it's not, then you're not going to have accurate cuts with the jigs. So make sure you get a right angle and actually take the throat plate off because sometimes that's not real even and it's not true. So off the table, you want to make sure you have 90 degrees on the back edge of the blade and 90 degrees to the side. This one happens to be okay, so it, we're set to go. But uh, follow your own manufacturer's instructions on how to do that. Uh, and I'm sure there's other YouTubes that you can watch, but uh, take the time to straighten it out first. Uh, the results will be a lot better after you do that. Okay, you're gonna want your table, your actually bandsaw wizard table, uh, mounted on your existing table so it rides perfectly perpendicular and parallel to your blade. If, if it's off a little bit then everything else of your T-slots will not cut properly. You won't get a 90 degree cut, you won't get a 45 degree cut if you measure it. So it's important that you actually put your guide runner in here and find out which one you need to use because there's actually two guide runners that come with your bandsaw table. There's one that's three quarter and one that's a little under by it's, it's marked minus. All of these slots aren't always the same size. Traditionally they're supposed to be three quarters but some are under, some are exact. The older ones are a little over. So what you do is you take one of the two sticks provided and you put it in your dado. This is a miter gauge dado. Now you see how loose that is? It seems like it's a little bit loose. Well, that's too loose. We want it more snug than that. You put the other one in, it's three quarter, and it actually slides, it doesn't wiggle. So that's actually the one we want. Now what's gonna happen is that we're gonna mount this, so there's your screw holes, we're gonna mount this to the underside of your bandsaw wizard table. So if you put this in here, now you know you selected the right one. Remove the other and you can use that for future projects for something else. Um, but now, depending on if you have a fence on your bandsaw or not, there's two different ways to approach getting this in a perfect position. Using your, your fence is actually going to be the easiest because if you take a look at the back of your table, which is down here, there is actually a saw kerf that we put on there so you know exactly where you want your bandsaw blade to land. This is the edge that's going to follow your fence on your bandsaw. And I happen to know that this dimension from here to here is nine and a half inches. So you get your trusty tape out and make sure I'm correct. Nine and a half, that's where you want it. So what you do is you set your fence to nine and a half. It's right. It's nine right now, but you've got to make sure that this fence is parallel to your dado in your table. If it's not parallel, you're going to have this track incorrectly and it's going to be always off. So do yourself a favor, true up your fence to your own miter gauge dado in your saw. Take a measure from here to here and then take another one on the back side of it. If it's equal, then we know this is going to be parallel to your dado. If it's not, um, you're going to complain that this jig doesn't work very well. So take your time and set it up correctly. So since we're using this fence, uh, I'm going to set it at nine and a half, tighten it down, and now we're set. So theory is you bring up your table. This edge is going to go up against there. You're going to turn your bandsaw on and you're just going to follow your table and pretty much cut into your own bandsaw wizard table. And you're going to cut it all the way to this point, which is this V groove. We want it to stop in the center of this T-track because that's going to become your pivot point for future circles or radius cuts or miscellaneous other items. <laughs> So uh, let's go ahead and cut it. Now that you've selected your guide runner that fits inside your, your own bandsaw's table, 
and it's a nice fit. And you've already measured the nine and a half inches required from your bandsaw's fence and the fence is parallel to your dado. Make sure it is. It's got to be parallel. Now you can cut your bandsaw wizard table and stop at the V groove. You're going to follow the fence and it's got to be tied up against the fence so you get a nice cut. Leave the guide runner in the bandsaw so you can actually screw it to the underside easily. Start slowly and let the machine and its blade do its job. There's no reason to rush a cut. You want a nice cut through this thing. And you want to stop at the V-groove. Coming close. So we're going to stop at the V-groove. There it is. You turn off the machine. It's still up against the fence. If you have a brake, use the brake on your bandsaw. Now the idea is that you're aligning this guide runner, and there's the other end, and I leave mine just proud of the other side. What I do is I clamp it, I'm pretty sure your shop has a clamp or two, clamp the ends so they stay put because what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to screw because there's two screw holes on the other side that you can access to just sitting like it is. I leave this a little long because it's easier to feed when you actually slide this off and you want to put it back on. It gives you an indicator of where it needs needs to be. So I'll clamp this on here. Then I'll grab a screw gun and a screw and mount a screw from the other side on here and here. So I do this because now I know that this is not going to slip and it's going to stay in the correct place. Make sure your table is tied up against the fence. So now it stays put. You can remove the table and its clamps. As you know, that guide runner is going to stay put. I'm going to flip it over, slide it out, flip it over, and we're going to we're going to put the remaining two screws in. So now it lives where it's supposed to be. slide my fence over and now this thing should ride exactly where it did before and it's independent and you can't wiggle it back and forth now you've got this blade right at the V groove so now you can actually mount your angle clamp on the underside as a stop that rests up against your fence's rail I happen to actually have a fence rail that's a little odd so I actually cut it to match the rail. So this gets mounted on the underside and you make sure this is centered on this T-track. Okay, now it's time to set your stop block and you want this table to stop always right at that V-groove, which happens to be the center of the pivot that you can adjust later. So you want it right in the center of that on the edge of the blade. If in fact you put a bigger blade on it, then you can adjust your stop 
So the front teeth are always in line with that center point. Now that you actually have your bandsaw blade centered on your pivot point, you need to install your stop lock and clamp. I happen to cut mine because it was not quite fitting right. So that's why it's out of wood. So you can do anything you need to. Yours may be different than my saw. Slide this in. You want to basically hit your rail or the edge of your table and clamp it down. Then you come up here and make sure that it's still on center. And it is. So tighten. And actually, you know, you don't have to tighten it real tight, just snug. There's no reason to over tighten anything. Now that you have your other stop block and clamp on the other end of the table and you have the blade where you want it and you want to have this table fixed so it does not move or slide or do anything, there's actually two more clamps and two more T-tracks that you actually put on either side of the kerf. That way you have a nice even table and it's not offset. So you end up putting this basically just like you did the other side. I already cut to the profile that I wanted for my edge of table and you tighten her up. It's pretty straightforward. You can leave these large, small, whatever you need to do. You might want to put your own radius or angle and now it's clamped and this thing does not move. Just an extension of your own table. Okay, you want to make sure your stop stops this table right at the correct spot where the center line of the edge of the teeth is perfectly aligned with the center of your pivot point. This way you're going to get a nice circle when you want to cut a template or a disc. This simply is adjusted by tightening the nut at any dimension you want up to the length of, of course, your table. I want to cut a circle or a disc using this bandsaw wizard table. Basically, I want something that's 13 and 3 quarters in diameter, which means I took a 14 inch square piece of plywood, because I needed out of plywood, connected the dots from the two corners, and found the center. I drilled a 5 16 hole in the center of this board, because I don't mind if there's going to be a hole in the disc that I'm making. If you don't want a hole, you can always actually just add something to your platform, like double stick tape or vacuum or anything that you can imagine. The idea is I want to set this pivot point six and seven eighths away from the edge of this blade. This is moved by just simply tightening this T-bolt. If we measure over six and seven eighths, there's six and seven eighths right there. Double check it. I just kind of snugged it. Six and seven eighths, right on the money. So I'll tighten it a little bit. So there's my six and seven eighths pivot. Now this doesn't work very well. So what you do is that, remember we have that stop underneath that always when you slide this will stop at the center. That's why we have a stop. So the idea is you bring this back far enough and you got to sometimes support the table with your other hand or provide a sawhorse underneath it because you don't want this tipping off of your own bandsaw's table. You mount the hole if you can find the pivot. So you see you only had to come a little bit back and there's your pivot. Make sure it's seated all the way down because this has threads, but this doesn't. Your pivot has threads, but your hole does not. So now you have still a little wiggly. Pound it down. So the idea is you turn on your bandsaw, you hold with your left hand your table, and your right hand with the piece you want to cut. Make sure everything's clear. Turn on your saw. Hold onto your piece. Slide the table into the saw. Once it hits the stop, now you start spinning it. I actually use my belly to hold the table up against the stop, but you can clamp it if you want. So now I'm cutting this circle. 
and I left a little meat on the outside on purpose so I don't end up with any flat spots. out of the way. Now what I do at this point, you can back it off, but I like to shut the saw off. I don't want to mess up the edge with the teeth by mistake. And then you can remove your circle. This is the sled part of this item, and this actually is a sled that actually slides on the table that we put on the bandsaw. Um, you can either do it freehand, or you can actually add and screw in the little runner, and now you can put it in a T-slot in the table, and now it's a miter gauge. Uh, the other item is, is that you can actually put something on top and pivot on the pivot points or slide something forward. And here's a measuring tape for your indicator for your vertical. The other items are small little clamps that you use a T-bolt, bolt it down so you can actually clamp something any direction you want. Okay, we have our table. It's secured to the bandsaw table and it actually wiggles the whole bandsaw. It's so tight. So it's not moving anywhere. It's centered on your edge of your blade. But now we're going to talk about the sled. The sled can be used just as an independent. You can clamp something on here, mount something on here at an angle or whatever you want and follow your own line and just use it freehand either on this table or your own bandsaw table. Or you can actually mount a guide runner on the underside and now it can follow and use as a miter gauge. So I have one already done. I've already mounted the guide runner into the last data and now it slides without tilting and follows your T-track. So now you can actually cut something just like a miter gauge. This will be 90 degree cut. This is 90 degree. We already know it's the, the line here is parallel to its cut. This is 90. So now you can trust it. So you can actually set other things on here as a guide and repeat any cut you want many times. So this can be done. Let's say we just want to cut the end off. Well, here's your miter gauge. And now you know it's going to be 90 degrees when you get it all cut. So let's just cut one. Hang on to it. You know, maybe it's a stop cut. You don't want to cut all the way through it. So now you have a nice cut. You cut all the way through and then you do what you want. But if you want stuff that's repeatable, you can actually put your clamps on here and follow something by making your own little tiny jig as a stop. So you can move this, you decide where you want your cut to be, and now you can repeat an action of however you want it cut. Let's say you wanted a line across there, and you wanted five or ten of them this exactly the same. Maybe you're making another jig or something. Doesn't matter. Use your little clamps that came with your carriage. Tighten your jig down or your stop down. So I didn't tighten over tighten these. Now you have a stop. And you can do anything you want. You can make your own items depending on what your application is. So now I'm going to cut an angle on this, whatever that angle I predetermined was.
but I'm leaving it up to you and your own imagination and your own application of what you want to do. So now I'm cutting a, a straight cut on it. And I can put another piece on there and do the same thing. So you can make up your own. And do as many as you want. And you can get the same cut. That's just using the sled all by itself. The parts, basically, this, the, these two parts are your vertical. So it pretty much goes together. And then your gussets go in here. So that's, that's your independent. There are, there's a slot in it, there's grooves on the back side, there's a measure indicator. Uh, there's lots going on. So a little assembly is required, but it's not that bad. Now that we have the carriage assembled by magic, it was done all by itself. Uh, here's what the carriage looks like. Uh, you can use either side of it. You can mount something on this side or you can mount something on this side. You can use a block of wood and a screw to hold something that you want to cut, or you can use a chuck. A chuck can be added. And as long as you have an adapter, you're going to need an adapter. And most folks probably have one if they do lathe work. This adapter is a 3 quarter inch 10 TPI, and then it matches whatever thread your chuck is, or the threads of your own lathe. The nice thing about it is that this adapter fits on your tailstock, and it's on your, actually your revolving tailstock, um, and this adapter for actually putting something on, on your tailstock of your lathe. So that's why we decided to use a three-quarter inch slot for a three-quarter inch 10 TPI, so you can just mount it onto the jig at any level you want. Now sometimes you got to counterbalance if it's real heavy on this side, but you can choose actually to mount it on the other side and just work on the other side and spin it or move it or angle cut it or whatever you want to do. The idea is that if I wanted to put a radius on something that's held way out here and I want a radius on it. So what I would do is I would actually mount this guide runner on the back side that its home lives here so you don't lose it. And this runs in the T-slot. So now you can actually slide this and adjust it by actually putting a teeth bolt in here, putting it over the appropriate, appropriate hole, lining up the guide. So now you can actually have this adjusted and it will stay put with your T-bolt. Now the nice thing is, this is going to run perpendicular to your table if, in fact, you put a guide runner in here and follow, follow the track in your table. You can put it anywhere you like. The other item is, is that if you want a radius on it, you have these different pivot points that have a metal sleeve that will follow a 5 6 T-bolt in your table. So now you choose where that location is going to be. You don't want to cut this off. If you put it in the wrong hole, you'll end up cutting this off on your bandsaw blade. So you choose the appropriate place where you want that pivot to be. You put your chuck or your other device or whatever you're going to use to clamp something on here, and you have something hanging out there. Now you can actually cut a pivot or a circle on your item. This carriage also can be used at different angles if you just rework it. You can lift this up, remove the rail, the guide rail. Now this can live up here and screw down so you don't lose it because I know how you guys are. You got sawdust on the floor and you're going to lose that little screw. So just mount it back inside and it will always be there. But you can actually put this in your, I call it the smiley face. 
So now you can actually have this anywhere you want the darn thing. But if you want a more precise pivot, you can actually follow one of the holes in the table itself and slide this through. Now it has an exact pivot and you can mark out any angle on here, tie it down, and you can always draw a line on your raw wood. And that's why I leave this raw wood. I'm a mill worker, have been for 40 years. I've been doing lots of jigs and I always like to draw something on my jigs, whether it be a note or a straight line or a reference. And then I can always erase it with a little sandpaper. If you choose, you can finish your own. Uh, I don't like mine finished only so I can draw on it. So there's the options of your carriage. Um, if you put your pivot, you're not going to be able to slide it. But if you take your pivot out, you can do many different things. You can use your carriage independently from anything. So you can actually mount an odd shaped piece if you want to put a special cut on it and it'll hold it pretty well. You end up, uh, if you don't have anything, just get a block of wood and screw it, screw your item to it. Let's just say we're going to cut a cove in this because you need a cove on something or you need to cut an odd shaped thing. So pretty much you come in here, you can eyeball it and follow a line that you want to do. Let's just say we're going to come across here. We want something like this close to it, but you'll know what your project means and needs. So it pretty much stayed put. I didn't follow the line exactly, but you get the idea of what you can do. You can come in here and put a V-groove in it. You can set up jigs yourself and make dovetail, uh, whatever you want to do. So that's just that part of it. Now, if you use the carriage independently, I'm hoping you will invent some indexes or whatever you think you need to do some things either consistently or repeatedly. If you use this carriage with a sled, you have a lot of different things you can do. I happen to put the guide runner on the last groove. So now you can use this back to your miter gauge that we talked about earlier, cutting things. But now you can actually add your carriage and you can mount it at a pivot or whatever you want to do or if you put your guide runner in here, then you can actually follow the track and cut something equally past the blade. So you have this adjustment forward and backwards to align anything. What I'd like to do is cut, I made this decanter. And I really want to have a decanter that has an angled cut on it. So what I want to do is when, once you have an adapter, a thread adapter, this is a three quarter inch, 10 TPI, teeth per inch. And this is actually a chuck that has a 30, M33 thread on it. You can actually mount it to this and cut at any angle you want when you set this up. So that's all I'm gonna do is set it up. This is put into, I call the smiley face because now you can move this anywhere you want within this track. So now I can set this at an angle wherever I want it. So pretty much I'm gonna install my decanter by using a three quarter inch bolt and tightening it up. Now this is reaching quite far, but that's okay. Once you tighten everything down, and look, this is too, too far, so I can't really slide it. So what I decided to do is put it on the other side. Turn it around, and now you can mount it on the back side. Now it's closer where you need to cut it. 
I'll take a socket wrench and tighten it down so it doesn't spin or move while we're cutting it. Now this can come independent now that I've taken the guide runner off and this can be mounted inside its groove so you can run it either way. I choose to run it this way so it actually ends up in the center because we reverse this. So now it's still in the center. So I decide, gee, I want about just a small little angle on it. So I can do it freehand. I'll tighten this down. I don't want to cut this off. So I'm going to push it forward a little bit just to make sure I don't accidentally cut off my jig. Turn on your bandsaw. Make sure it's tight. And now I'm going to just basically put an angle on it. Oh, missed. Because I'm not, I don't want to stand in front of the camera, so I'll cut it again. Or you can put a curve on it. So, use your imagination. That's what this thing is for. So that'll cut the decanter on a chuck. Of course, a chuck is a real handy thing to clamp anything. You can put a piece of wood in it. Uh, you can put odd shaped things in it because it'll grab it. So that's why I like to use a chuck on this if you have a lathe or not. A chuck is a really handy item to use on this. The nice thing about using the adapter is that you can leave the adapter attached and in its original place. Take this back to the lathe and then screw it back on for another action and it goes exactly where you left off because it was tied up against it. Here's just a blank piece of wood that I want to put a curve on it one way or the other. So basically you can use this jig if you put a pivot attachment into your table throw your pivot, decide the distance away from the blade that you want. I choose seven inches. There's seven inches right there. Tighten it down. I use just a socket. And now you can choose one of these four. I wouldn't choose this one because you're going to cut the darn thing off. So make sure you're oriented correctly. The reason why these other ones here, what happens if you want to pivot way back here and you need the throw of your carriage or you can run it backwards. So I chose seven and this one because it clears. Now that I can pivot this, I can actually use a clamp and actually put partial curves on any piece of plywood or any material you want by using those other clamps that I showed you earlier. But right now, what we're going to do is we're going to slide the carriage in here. With this guide rudder on the bottom. So now this gives me the flexibility of moving this towards or away from the blade so I can adjust where I want this to land as a cut. So I'm going to choose to mount this particular chuck with this item in it on the face of this. Oh, I need an adapter. These adapters, I'm sure a lot of lathe people have these, but these are uh, available independently through a bunch of catalogs. And it has the thread of your chuck or your spindle on your lathe and then a three quarter, 10 teeth per inch. So you mount that on the other side, locate kind of the height you need so you can add your chuck to it and remove it if you want. This is just a bowl I never finished. <laughs> so, but it's a piece of wood that could be any project of yours at any shape, but this is how 
we will cut actually a crown on top of this. So see, it doesn't quite reach, so you can adjust this to find out. Now, how do you know where to go? Well, you know kind of what the radius is going to be, so you can put a stick on here and figure out where it's going to land. But you see how this is tilting? Because this is heavy and it's not tight. Once you tighten this, it'll stay put. But sometimes, you know, you may want to put a counterbalance or put it on the other side, but it, it'll cut off the other end, so you don't want to do that. So I, I know that this is probably going to be close, but we're going to cut it shallow just so you can see how you can adjust it later on. So I turn on the saw. Hang on to it, keeping your fingers clear of the blade. It's on its pivot point. Start in slow and have a consistent cut. Now, see, I didn't quite make it. Okay, since you can see that we cut this and we kind of guessed at it, there's an easier way to do it to get a more precise cut. What you do is you back your unit off a little bit, turn it around, and you know, there's a measuring device here and a scale. So if you, in fact, know where zero is, and you tighten it down and it touches the blade, tighten it down there and read what the scale says. It says, it reads five and a half. So you can write that down, five and a half, and you actually, you, know, you can write it right here because you can sand it off later or put it on a tablet or put it on here. So now you know where zero is. Now you want to you actually know to cut this a little bit more so if you're just putting a crown on this. But what happens if you want to cut way back here and then glue it back together later because you're putting a veneer piece in here for a detail? Well, if you know how far to go back, then all you got to do is subtract and figure out, gee, I'm going to push this an inch and a half. So I'm going to bring this down to four inches and now the cut will be back in here. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to actually move this so you can't turn it. You've got to back it off because it's going to pinch the blade because it's a curve and this is a flat. So back it off. I know I want to set this at four inches. I'll set it at four inches. Tighten it down. And now you can see how far back it's going to cut back here, which is what I want. So if you use your scale with this, and you know how to operate it, and it already has been zeroed out, you always kind of know where you can go just by either jotting it down. Uh, I have to jot things down these days because my memory is uh, fading me. So I jot it down always. Turn the saw on. You know, it's not a speed in a race. Let the saw do its work and let it cut. Now this piece will drop. So now you have a nice curve. Now, in time, if this was a bowl, hollow, this is just a solid piece right now, we could actually sandwich something here and glue it back. And then do another one. Or turn this and do a cross. And we'll talk about an indexer later. So that's how this is done. So imagine your project, you setting up your own and figure out how you can work it. Use your measuring device, use your sled, use your carriage. Let's pretend this is a real fancy vessel. I just made something simple. And I put it in a chuck. Well, what I did is I cut a piece of scrap plywood and I made it the width of my cut, and I made it the length, which is to the end of this, and inside where this is going to bottom out, the dovetail is going to bottom out, and it bottoms out at the end of this, in the inside of this jaw. So now what we can do is if you orient these jaws perfectly up and down and horizontal, now I can take this out and put this scrap piece in there with the chuck and practice on a scrap piece. So if you loosen this, now I've already tightened this tight, so you should be able just to undo this. But being as that this is already on here, 
just for a demonstration, I'm going to take it off and put that piece of plywood on so you can see what's going on. Nice thing about the chuck staying put is that you can take things off and put things on anywhere you want. Now, what I want to do is put this piece of plywood in a proper spot, open it up. Now, you know, if I was smart, I would put a little mark on here to center it, here and here, measure over, but you could take a tape and kind of center it. So this is going to equal where this is 7 eighths and the other side is 15 16 just a hair off. So I slide it over just a hair. I'm going to tighten it down. So now you have a blank piece that you can spin through this and you can even make lines on this template. You know, any shop always has a lot of scrap wood. Go to your local cabinet maker or somebody and get some scrap wood because it's always nice to do something on a piece of scrap wood than on your final product. Okay, we have our test piece mounted in a chuck and we put it on here. I've got adjustability. It's at a pivot point and I made some marks. There's two inch, four inch, six inches. I just made a little mark on here because that's kind of where I probably want to have, want to have um, my radius on that vessel I showed you earlier. So, I want to know where that crown is going to be at the very top. So I'm going to zero this out again. Just touch it. Tighten it. And it's at 9 and hmm, 9 and 11 sixteenths. So I write it down. 9 11 sixteenths. This is zero. Equals zero. So now I want to cut that very tip of that vessel out. So I'm going to back it off, let's say 5 16 So we move it back. You got 9 and 11 minus 5 16 So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So there you go. It's set. I just took that subtraction right off of these lines here. And now supposedly this will come real close to this end here. So let's let's Give it a go. Now it vibrates a little bit, but this is a test piece. So you want to see where your arcs are going to be. So that's going to cut the very end, and we know what that number is. What is it? It's 9 and 3 eighths. So top. 9 and 3 eighths. So now I can decide where I want to do the first cut and then glue it back together and do another cut and glue it back together because I'm going to have accent marks in this vessel. So we can take this off. Let's decide. Let's say, gee, do we want to work from the bottom up or from the top down on our vessel? All right. Just for giggles, we're going to start right in the middle. You can do anything you want. It's your jig. So I measure this and I'm actually putting that little line right there. That's where I want it to end up on my vessel because I've already planned it out. Now I can write that number down. It's six and mm, seven sixteenths. And I put mid. All my answers are right here. So when I forget, I can go look. So remove this. Add the thing you're going to put a radius on. Nice and snug. And the carriage is tight. So now we're going to cut.
So, when I was going through, I forgot to put a, a line on there. I always try to put a line on there so I, when I go back together, I know exactly where it came out. But it's pretty semi woodworker proof because it's going to be kind of hard not to glue it the right spot because of the curves. So that's how you do that. Glue something in there, start all over again. When you're doing radius cuts with your sled and perhaps even your carriage attached to it, you'll notice that these have little clip corners. Um, the reason is, is that we want the uh, bandsaw not to cut this all up. If you put this pivot too close to your blade, you're going to end up cutting right across it. Roughly about five inches uh, is about the, the closest you can get, maybe a little closer, without cutting your jig. So what bandsaw wizards did is that they're actually giving you an adapter so you can do tighter radiuses. That actually just fits. So you can leave it on or you can take it off. It fits on the end of it. So now you can actually move this pivot point very close to your bandsaw blade. So you come along here, you know, you'd measure, maybe you got an inch and a half. Now you can put this on there and now your sled, you can chew quite a bit. So you're putting something on here, you're starting to cut it, you're just doing a tiny radius. You end up with a really close, almost <laughs> completely to it. So it has lots of forgiveness for this little extra. So that was in, in lieu of making this huge sled with this point always attached. Because sometimes you just don't need that point. A lot of people are asking, we do curves and cut curves on a bowl or any object, but can we index it? And yes, we can. You can see here that these are actually equal distance apart, but it's really only two cuts. One cut, took apart, put some veneer air, glue it back together, then I moved it another so many degrees or so many holes on an index. So you can do as many as you want. Um, a lot of chucks, and some don't, some do, have holes on the back side of it. Uh, I do lathe work, a lot of people do, and when you put your chuck on your item, you have holes. And actually, this Vicmark, uh, I believe, only has 24 holes. Normally speaking, those who do segmenting want 32. So I decided to make a separate wheel so it could fit any chuck you have, um, and it's actually put together uh, with the revolving tailstock chuck adapter. So the chuck adapter is something that you can get it in a couple of different catalogs if you're a lathe turner. And this goes on the tailstock and screws onto the tailstock. So now you can reverse your chuck and hold it differently and do something else with your headstock on your lathe. Uh, I have a couple of these. They're very useful because I do a lot of reversing um, and changing things around. So the reason why this slot in here is so big, because I chose the 3 quarter inch 10 TPI, because you can get a bolt just about anywhere. So that's what I use. This you can move up and down, and it works well. So that's what you see in other videos. But what we want is we want to be able to have a pin go through here and go into one of those chuck holes or uh, the hole that's in the disc. So what we did is we put together a system where actually you have this now can be through this fixed hole. Now when you tie that in together, you can move and adjust this any height you want the chuck stays put, and when you loosen this or tighten it, doesn't matter. This chuck always stays in the same position. Now, if we want a pin to do our work, we have another item that goes in the back. That's adjustable. And now you can slide a pin through here, and you can match the height of your chuck or the height of the disc that we made. 
the disk. This is a 32 hole disk. Um, and we thought it'd be really smart to, to put it together here, but these don't come with tapped holes. So we decided to make our own. Uh, we, this is precise, so when you install this thing, uh, it pretty much gets applied, and now you have something that is predictable. It can go on either side. So we try to make this thing uh, really universal, uh, so you can uh, invent anything you need that you need to cut on a bandsaw. Okay, here's one that's all put together, and now we can see what it really looks like. You have a chuck that's actually you can take off at any time, and when you tighten it up, it's always going to register at the same spot because it's going to be tight against the threads. Just like the lathe that you have, you're going to tighten the chuck on there, and it's going to stop. Well, the same theory goes here. So now you can take this off at any time, and your indexer is staying put, not adjusted, it doesn't move. Now in order to uh, assemble this thing, you have this that slides up and down, um, and, it's, and this slides up and down also. So your pin can be aligned with the index. Now how it stays put is that you just undo or tighten the large bolt. Now it seems like a pain in the neck, but it gives you the most versatility of putting any size chuck, any size item, um, and the av av availability to move this up and down. You loosen some knobs, you can actually slide this whole thing up and down, back to your hole. So this whole thing will move up and down so you can actually have this anywhere you need it. So right now it's loose, but once you have it in the hole, your index pin, it's just a pin, a loose pin, comes through, you line it up, now you know you have, and it doesn't matter which hole you start out at because now that you want to tighten it up, it'll always register where you started. So I'm going to consider that zero. Now, I like to mark the holes of where I want the next cut. And if you see the item here, I already did two cuts and glued them back together. But I want another cut coming in here. So where is that? Well, I did one, two cuts. I'm going to back it off and put it right in the middle. And hopefully it'll land in the middle if I put this in the chuck back to where I started. Now I happen to know that only because it's the first position, 1P, because I wrote the stuff down. That's why I like raw stuff. I write things down on here. First position, which is the first hole. The radius is five, so I've already got this set at five inches. And the sled, front to back, is 160 millimeters, or six and three quarter inch. So I've already got that set. So the theory is, if I put this chuck on here, now you can adjust this before or after the chuck is on here, but I'm gonna do it with the chuck in because it's heavy. So you can see that it does work. Now this does not move. So I wanna move this chuck so many degrees, but how about we put this at the original position, which I marked, and I marked. So I guess I need a wrench, chuck wrench, line it up. So this was the original first cut. This was the second cut, which is actually a position down here. We loosen this up, slide the pin out, Oop. slide the pin in where the next position is. Now you see how wobbly it is? That's because it's not tight. This actually screws back in and reposition this for us. 
Now there's no fancy way to do this, but it's efficient. Now, if you had a mechanism and all this other stuff, it would cost an arm and a leg. This doesn't cost an arm and a leg. So now we're hoping to get this thing spun and do another layer. So let's see what happens. This we decided was on the first position. So, you know, and I'm seeing over here, I'm looking on the back side. Oh, it's right where it needs to be. Now, if I show the camera, I can actually put this on this way. Now, can you see where it's going to cut? So you can line it up and now it's going to do another pass at the same location. Now I could slide this in or out and do a completely different design down here or even up here. It all depends on what you're after or what cut you are or what you're doing. It may not be a bowl. It may not be a vessel. It may be just an oddball item that you're putting all these angles on. Radius. Um, so let's cut this thing and see what happens. You don't need to be in a big hurry. Let the saw do its work. Let it cut. It's not a rake. So now you can see where the old layers were. And now we're adding a new layer. So it gets segmented almost. So I guess this is a lazy man to segment something. Anyway, that's how the indexer works. Um, the, here's the problem that a lot of people may or may not have. Let's say this extends out further. Let's say this is a big heavy item. And all of a sudden you have something that's out of balance. So what I do is Shock, an old sock, you know. The dryer eats one of my socks all the time, so I have these leftover socks that I just put lead ballast in. Lead shot, go to the hardware store and get it. So it actually works really well to counterbalance something. Here's the thing, when you do a jig work on any machine, sometimes you have to support the table that's sliding, sometimes you have to support an outfeed or inboard. Uh, sometimes you have to uh, counterbalance something. It's just the way it is. Otherwise, you have to build this huge jig that's really heavy and just to support something that you might or might not have. So don't be afraid to use even rocks would work. Sand would work. Anyway, there's a tip. And that's for the index. People have asked me what an offset offset curve is. An offset curve is something that doesn't go from point A to B exactly equal from the bottom of your bowl or the bottom of your uh, item you're cutting. So it starts and enters at this level and it ends at that level. Imagine if this carriage was not parallel with your pivot point. If it was offset, now you would start high and end low. So that's an offset curve. So we're going to show you an offset curve, basically. <clears throat> you can see how it's low, goes around, and it's high. So they're not equal. It's offset. So this I've already cut twice uh, and put back together. So we're going to cut it a third time to show you. Now, the thing is, I want to show you on an index because now you can get these offset correctly. An index that we remove the wheel and it's actually using, see the wheel's not there for your pin. We're using the back side of this chuck with its own holes. In order to do that, we had to sharpen and put a point right on this, this pin. So now it'll work with your chuck if you have holes in the back of it. So we're lining it up with the original index point, but 
as a safety feature, it would be good to have, since this has a taper on it, it would be nice to have support from the table. So I'm going to show you that this can be adjusted downwards. So it's resting in the right spot. You can still spin it, but actually part of it, this tip is still on the table. So what we'll do is we'll put this back in its original position, if I can find it. Loosen up the bolt. And now you see I've loosened this and this, and now this thing can slide up and down. And this actually holds it. So if you can set it there, you can set it there, you can set it up taller. It all depends on where you want to go with it. So let's leave it there. Where was it? There it is. So I have marks on here. So now I want this to touch the table. And now it'll give it extra support while I'm making that cut. So I have to move this so it aligns with the hole. And there's a knob on the back side that tightens the location for your pin. And then tighten the bolt, which tightens everything together. So the chuck stays put. Now, it's laying flat here. It's touching there. So now when we cut it, there's a little extra support. The other way to do it also is hold tightly or put a counterweight on the back side. So we're showing you different ways to do the same thing. What we're after here is we want a different cut. And so actually I set it up for a different cut. This was the same offset curve. I already did it twice. I marked halfway between both cuts. So I'm going to do another cut that is going to offset it. And actually, you can pick it up, put it on the other side, so you can see kind of where it's going to land. Because that will be going through the blade. It's going to land there. Now, is that a choice? Well, I'm just going to show you that it's different cuts and different items. Is it parallel? You can change this. You can put this pin at different locations by moving this head one way or the other. Uh, let's just see what this pattern or design is going to look like based on splitting the two differences. So let the blade do its work. Starts out low, gonna end up high. Make sure that you catch the piece because you don't want it uh, accidentally going into the blade after the fact. So now you have an offset cut. So it's not equal on both sides. Glue that back together, put some veneer in there, and make it another pattern. There you go. Uh, occasionally people want to cut uh, either freehand, uh, which you can uh, on any of these two jigs, uh, the sled or the carriage independently or together. Uh, but what I did here is sometimes you want precise lines. Uh, you can put an index in here and, and segment the thing. Uh, but I just wanted to show you that there's a reason for this other bar over here, this track. And if you put your guide runner in the, in the right spot, um, you can choose any of these, but I chose on the end so it can actually uh, run right in this guide. So we can cut this and then take it out and then we can repeat the same cut if, if necessary. So the nice thing about these jigs is it's repeatable. So this one here, now you can have this slide side to side, set it up and this one you can plunge and you can get your cut. So let's just say you want it in the center, you cut it in the center. Let's say for some reason you just wanted to cut here and you wanted another one here. Um, 
So you just line it up. It's pretty straightforward. Undo your knob, eyeball it there. I'm actually looking at it from back here because I can see where this lines up. Tighten it up, eh, it's not quite right. Bring it back to make sure it's uh, not in the blade when you start. Depending on what you want to cut or how you want to cut it, uh, you may want to increase the width of your blade. I use a 3 8 blade for a lot of radius work because it clears and doesn't get pinched. If you do straight cuts, I recommend a half inch wide, a three quarter wide, an inch wide, depending on how wide a blade your saw can take. So the wider the blade, the straighter the cut you're going to get. The wizard jigs are pretty much a foundation jig. Uh, you can use a table for many different things. You can use the sled for many different things. You can use the carriage all together, uh, independently. And actually, it's up to your imagination of what you want to hold with it. So I was looking at YouTube uh, the other day, and I noticed uh, there's a guy with, that makes the dowels on a bandsaw. It's pretty straightforward, but he had a bunch of clamps and uh, all this stuff that you already have all this stuff, um, you can actually do something. So I took the carriage and I made a couple of pieces here that you can go up and down with and slide to and fro. And if you think about it uh, and you put it in a track, um, put your guide runner in there, you can actually slide this here or you can slide it here uh, because that's why we have both tracks. So I'm gonna show you how you can use this standard jig system uh, to cut a dowel. The first thing you do is, uh, I made this universal, so you drill a hole and you draw a line tangent to that hole because that's where you want a saw cut. We want to be able to cut this just like this and have it as deep as the cut. The blade is going to be that deep. And then once we cut it, on the tangent of that circle or the hole, I happen to have, I believe, an oddball size because you can't buy a 15 16 dowel. Uh, you can't buy, you know, one in three sixteenths dowel. You can buy inch and a quarter, uh, but sometimes I'll do small ones out of ebony or cocobolo or something. So we make our own uh, dowels, and this is a real easy way to do it. Uh, I made these independent because I wanted these to be able to to come apart so I could have a standard item of where I have different holes that I've already figured out and we can actually just change them out. So you pretty much clamp it in. Now you can use any scrap wood as long as it's solid. Um, I kind of squared it in each end off so it's 90 degrees from the table. Um, it makes it a smoother run and made this jig so it makes it real easy uh, to adjust, uh, to cut, and then realign on the other side. And it's the realignment on the other side of the blade that is the key. So in order to make this cut, uh, you want to do it safely. So this guide runner goes in the track. This is loose, so the height is okay, because it's right down on the table. So this actually tightens it. So now it slides. Now what we need to do is go side to side and actually align this cut right on that line. <clears throat> so it's actually at the tangent 
very edge of that hole. And I can feel it in here. And it's pretty much, it's a little bit this way. If you go too far into the hole, then your dowel will be smaller than what you want. So you have to have it right on the edge. There you go. So you tighten this down. Now we can plunge it in really nice and straight. Now this is a, a key that as long as your blade is 90 degrees from the table that we talked about earlier, this will be a really nice cut when we put this on the other side. We want to be able to cut this in here that deep. Right about there. So now we have a hole with the slice and the teeth will rest right inside there. All right, we had just finished cutting the slot into this uh, dowel making jig. And so now what we're going to do is put it on the other side. Uh, this has a tightening knob, so you put the guide runner in the guide and put your T-bolt in there. And look, oh gee, we, we want to put it on the other side. So you can take this off or you can actually put it around the other side. You can walk it back to the other side and put it in this way. So now what we want to do is align that groove that you just cut, or that cut, so the blade goes right in there. And now your teeth are just proud of this by maybe, uh, you know, a 1 18th. Um, can you measure that? I don't think so. But just a hair. It works a little better when it happens that way. So you tighten that down. The height is tightened. Now the carriage back here is tightened. Now when you, this actually just works like another set of guide blocks um, and your blade doesn't uh, move when you're forcing a piece of wood in here. So decide the size of dowel you want. This happens to be, I think, 15 sixteenths. I made this 7 eighths, um, drilled a hole in the exact center, then I took it to the, the bandsaw and just made an octagon on this side. Now remember when you were a kid, you wanted to whittle? Well, you get a whittle. So you whittle the end so it's a little smaller than the octagon so that whittle part can actually fit in that hole. Then what I end up doing is putting a, <laughs> what is this, a, a bolt, which is a lag bolt on the end. And you put your old uh, trusty screw gun. Everybody's got a screw gun, right? Uh, everybody's got to have one of these. It's a cool toy. So you're going to spin this while the thing turns. So I seat it. There we go. You turn on your bandsaw. And you want it going opposite where the teeth is going. The teeth are going down. You want to spin it clockwise. So you end up putting this in the hole. You can hear it, you want to cut it, but now you start spinning it. And you're actually pushing it through as the thing cuts it for you. Easy dowel. You sand this up, and you have the size that you want depending on the size of holes you make. Okay, uh, another uh, item you can uh, do, and actually you can do more than I can imagine, so I'm hoping I'll get uh, feedback from people on how they're using this jig. Um, I'm using part of the last jig that I just used, which was the dowel jig, and I took the, the face piece off of it, 
and I put this wood block on the bottom that can slide. So it's pretty straightforward. You can make this. Um, you can make one going the other way too. But what we're going to talk about is copying uh, a curve or uh, an S curve or anything. Um, and you can make a duplicator out of your bandsaw. Uh, just uh, imagine this sitting on the side of your, your bandsaw blade. Um, these two points act like a router bearing. So if you have a template that's a curve, it follows these two points. And if you have a piece of material on top, it'll and stick to it, whether it be by vacuum or double stick tape or clamps or however you want to do it, um, you can duplicate the same thing over and over and over and over again. Uh, you don't have to set up any other jigs. It's just this simple one. So the idea is, is that you make enough space in here for this to go freely on either side. And I kind of made it a little bigger because I want the chip to be kind of, a, or the, the blade teeth to be kind of right in the middle of this so you have a point and a point that this thing is going to follow. I also made this less tall. So this is three quarters, this is about five eighths thick because I don't want the secondary piece that's going to be cut to interfere with anything. So if we put this in your jig, line up your T-bolt, And we slide this with your T-bolt and your knob. Then you can align this to exactly where you want it to be and slide this to where you want it to be and have it stay put. So, you know, these are your clamps. These are already set up, so you don't have to worry about screwing this to the substrate or anything. So now you have a point of what this will follow. Now this isn't quite far enough out because it's going to change it because it's giving a little bit. So I really need to slide this a little further so it's actually resting like another guide block. See? So, let's say you want to cut, I don't know, let's just make it easy. Uh, you want to cut something, whatever it is. You know, you have a template that maybe you've already routed or you've already spun uh, on a radius. Uh, so, what we're going to do is actually use a bandsaw as a regular bandsaw and cut this. <laughs> Whatever it is. Now, you've got to make sure whatever mass you're taking out of here, you've got to make up for the space here and here. So you don't want to cut any more off, otherwise, you know, the chunk is going to be cut, your off fall is going to be hitting your, your jig. So this is more for edge work. Uh, you can actually reverse this and turn it around so this shifts over further if you like. Uh, it's, it all depends on how you want to use your jigs. What I end up doing is taking a similar size board and just double sticking tape to it. And now hopefully, the theory is, uh, if you set this back up, you follow this and it'll cut it. it wasn't a perfect cut but you get the idea I find it a lot easier if in fact you take this and make a different one which I don't have and make it so the template is on the top
you'd have to make a different one to put this tongue on the other side um, and then you run the template on the top so you're actually running this so you can actually see it better um, but I was looking for it today and I couldn't find it so <laughs> so you can do it either way as long as this is clearing the bottom thing that you're cutting off so that's just another thing that you can invent or do I'm sure there's many different ways to do this on YouTube but this is just another item that you can plant on the foundation jig system. I've been asked about compound curves. Why would I ever use it? And the answer is, I don't know. It's a design feature that actually you can create um, and play with. So this is how you do it. You can set your bandsaw table at any angle. Uh, some of them you can, some of them you can't. This one goes up to 45. I chose 15 degrees only for the camera so they can see what's going on. The higher you go, the longer the blade you have to have uh, distance or the bigger distance you have to have to cut it because it's a longer cut across here. So make sure you have that cut if you do something greater than 15 degrees. Basically, I took this. It's just so I haven't hollowed it out just for an example of how to do it. The nice thing is about this table, it clamps to the existing table, and actually this is wiggling the whole bandsaw. It's actually sturdy. Um, I put a pivot point on here. Uh, we're gonna spin this, and you can see what a compound curve looks like. Now, will you ever use one of those? I don't know. But imagine what you can do with it. With a tighter radius, a bigger radius, glue it back together or not. Um, it has possibilities. Uh, so, make something and show me. Thanks. After many years of putting uh, my, my son's uh, projects on the refrigerator with magnets, and I saw all these fancy business cards that were magnets and other things that were magnets that you put on the refrigerator, I always wanted to make a magnet for a sign. So I decided to make a bandsaw magnet, um, which actually comes with the table, and it's a cheat sheet. And so what this is is... Two things, how many teeth per inch? How many teeth on the blade should you use for the thickness of material you're gonna be cutting? I can say nine times out of nine, most people put too many teeth or use too many teeth on their bandsaw because they think it's gonna get a finer cut. That would be not, it doesn't happen that way. You have to have enough space between the teeth to get rid of that excess material. Otherwise it just burns. That's why your blade's burning if you have too many teeth. So here's a rule of thumb. You take 24, divide it by the thickness of the material you're cutting. Let's say you have eight quarter material, okay? Eight quarters, two inches thick. So that means 24 divided by two inches thick means you're gonna have no more than 12 teeth per inch on that blade. If you have more than that, you might get a little finer cut, but you may have to cut a little slower because you have to let the debris get out of the way so it doesn't burn. If you try to force it, it'll burn. If you use less teeth, it's okay. You've got to have a plus and minus there somewhere. This is just a recommendation of where you should be approximately. If I have a chunk of wood that's 24 inches tall, I have a bandsaw that will cut that, I don't need but one inch, excuse me, one tooth per inch on that 24 inch thick piece of wood. 24 divided by 24 is one tooth per inch on the blade. So keep that in mind, it's a cheat sheet. 
the smallest possible radius. A lot of people are trying to do small radiuses on a bandsaw. Well, I like to use 3 8 and this particular blade that I like to use only has four teeth per inch. Sometimes I use six, but it does the job I need to do for a variety of different thicknesses. Uh, if you have a quarter inch blade, not a 3 8 the 3 8 the tightest radius you can do is around two and a half inch. Now, some guys will challenge it. I'm okay with it if you get a smaller radius, but sometimes your blade will pinch against the excess material you're trying to cut off, and now you don't get a perfect cut. You can, you can force it a little differently. Uh, this is just a recommendation and average. So, again, I always wanted to make a magnet for a refrigerator. I made one for a bandsaw instead.